So this is, um, this is not pertinent to my, to my sermon at all, um, but, but I've, I've been told that uh, the way that, that Christmas sermons ought to begin this Sunday is with the line, a long time ago in a Galilee, in a Galilee far, far away. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't come up with that. No, that's a... In the year 1799, the famous German philosopher and theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher published a short collection of lectures entitled On Religion, Speeches to Its Cultured Despisers. Cultured Despisers. Don't you just love that title? Schleiermacher, who, by the way, has been called the father of liberal theology, uh, in these speeches was addressing those who had rejected religion as too dogmatic and doctrinal, as superstition, and as irrelevant in an age of reason and science, reason and fact. I should also mention that Schleiermacher published these speeches anonymously. So controversial was this project of defending religion. Imagine that in 1799, he was skittish about defending religion. And what Schleiermacher attempted to do in his speeches was to make a case for religion that is liberated from its errors and meaningful and useful and relevant to those who had pretty much given up on religion. Now, I don't always begin my sermons by talking about European philosophers from 200 years ago, but in a sense, Schleiermacher's project feels oddly relevant today. As a Unitarian Universalist minister, I recognize that part of my audience, part of the congregation on any Sunday, will contain more than a few cultured despisers of religion. You know who you are. <laughs> how, how many of you really enjoyed singing the parody, God Rest Ye Merry Gentle, uh, Unitarians? Yeah, okay. Hits a little close to home, doesn't it? That's kind of the thing that, that we do, right? We take religious stories and we challenge them with, with a healthy dose of reason and fact and historical contextualization. And, and in doing so, we risk becoming those, those cultured despisers of religion. Of course, it's also the holiday season. Christmas is almost here, and I, I also have to recognize that any December sitting in the pews, there's likely to be at least a few cultured despisers of Christmas. And I'm not talking so much about the people who feel lonely or depressed or stressed or sad around the holiday season, though that pain, that hurt is very real. I'm talking about those who regard this time of the year with cynicism and skepticism, for its materialism, its commercialism, its sentimentality, its emotional tyranny. If you yourself are not a cultured despiser of Christmas, I bet you know someone who is. And then there are, of course, other ways to be a cultured despiser. Election season is here. <laughs> or is there anybody who, who considers himself a cultured despiser of the political process? All right, you know? The first caucuses and primaries are only a little more than a month away, and in the throes of election season, we're also inundated with stories of candidates and campaigns behaving badly. Every gaffe and embarrassment, every mistake and insult, attack and lie, every bit of negative campaigning, every scandal and distraction, it'll happen to, to everybody. When it touches the candidates we despise, we will take it as confirmation of everything negative we think of them. And when it hits the candidates we support, as inevitably it will, we get agitated and maybe make excuses so as to avoid cognitive dissonance. <laughs> but for many of us, all this will too quickly grow exhausting and will become the cultured despisers of politics. I think we, know, we know what that feels like, right? And even more, speaking of loss of faith, speaking of disillusionment and disenchantment, aren't some of us, aren't some of us, the, really the cultured despisers of, of American society or, or our culture or even the human condition. Take whatever cruelty, whatever devastation, whatever environmental catastrophe, whatever injustice, whatever in violence and warfare, whatever oppression, whatever stupidity and banality and senselessness, take all of this or part of this and admit that sense of cynicism 
skepticism, sarcasm, and scoffing. And you know, you know what it feels like to be a cultured despiser. It's something any of us might feel from time to time, right? That sense of, well, you call me a pessimist, but I prefer to think of myself as a realist. And so this morning, we're going to kind of talk about all of these things, for they all follow, I think, a common spiritual pattern. Has anyone here ever felt disillusioned and disenchanted? I've named four areas where one may feel a sense of disillusionment and disenchantment. Religion, the holidays, politics, American society as a whole. You could probably add your own, though. You might feel disillusioned in a relationship with a family member, with an organization, with with this church, with someone you admire who turns out to be a fraud or a hypocrite. And maybe sometimes that's where it ends, with the disillusionment and the despising but not always. Disillusionment doesn't have to be the last word. Disenchantment is not necessarily the end of the story, for there's a possibility of another movement and another turning. There is the possibility of re-enchantment. And I think that was Schleiermacher's project with, with religion in those speeches 200 years ago. My favorite thinker, though, who describes this journey of faith Um, is a 20th century French philosopher named Paul Ricoeur. Like I said, I I don't always talk about European philosophers in every sermon I give. You're just lucky this morning. And let me say this about, about Ricoeur, just parenthetically, that I don't think I've ever read anyone as challenging and frustrating and, and inaccessible as Ricoeur. So if anybody out there is like a philosophy major or a philosophy scholar who thinks you understand Ricoeur, um, please let me know what, what, what he's talking about, because frankly, I don't know. Um, but Ricoeur does have this way of talking about what I'm trying to talk about this morning. Ricoeur, in, in Ricoeur's terminology, he says that our first religious learning happens at the level of naivete. That's the first naivete is his word for it. And we might call that literal or unquestioning faith. At the level of first naivete, we take stories at face value. We take them literally. But when our literal understanding erodes, we find ourselves standing at the next step, which, is, which he calls critical distance. Once subjected to rational inspection, the literal meanings of religion really do not hold up. Once a person allows himself or herself to take a step back from religious belief and examine it critically, that person cannot believe the simple naive concepts that their religion teaches. But for Ricoeur, there is a third stage that happens only after that period of critical distance. Ricoeur refers to this stage as second naivete. I love love that term, second naivete. In second naivete, scripture and religious concepts are seen as symbols that we now interpret in the full responsibility of autonomous thought. This means we accept that the myths we held as truth in the first naivete are in fact myths, but have passed through the critical distance we begin to re-engage these concepts at a different level. We no longer accept them at face value as presented by religious authorities, but rather interpret them for ourselves in the light of having assumed personal responsibility for our beliefs. We choose to move toward our own interpretation that recognizes these concepts as symbols of something greater than that which the words or teachings imply in their literal sense. So in Ricoeur's terms, it's first naivete, critical distance, second naivete, or as I'm going to call them this morning, enchantment, disenchantment, and re-enchantment. The responsive reading that uh, Eric led earlier follows this same developmental trajectory. First naivete, when I was a child, I had no trouble believing wondrous things. Critical distance. Then they told me a supernova appeared in the sky, so the story of the star was explained. Then second naivete, but I found I was unwilling to give up the star, fitting symbol for the birth of one whose uncommon life has long been remembered. Christmas in particular and the the various holidays of winter seem to me to be a splendid opportunity for practicing this idea of re-enchantment. 
One of my, my proud possessions is this tattered book, Celebrating Christmas, a 300-page anthology of readings and prayers and poems about Christmas written by Unitarians. And you'd think there'd never be reason for a Unitarian to write anything ever again about Christmas. <laughs> I, find it, I find it remarkable, though, that so many, so many of these, these readings and prayers and poems begin with an exhortation to embrace this second naivete. One favorite reading of mine begins, I wish for the dull a little understanding, and for the understanding a little poetry. It seems that Christmas time with its angels and star, its prophecies and dreams, its miracles, its miraculous birth, invites this type of interpretation. And Hanukkah, too, with its day's worth of oil lasting eight nights. I think by engaging with these traditions that we actually practice this third way of looking at the world. And so I wonder, are there other places in our life where such a second naivete can be embraced? At the hospital um, where I was a chaplain, there was a curious case. An adolescent girl from Southeast Asia came in, was brought into the psychiatric unit. She was having a full-blown psychotic episode, and she um, was, was sort of yelling and screaming about hearing voices and about demons that were tormenting her. The doctors and nurses in the psychiatric unit tried everything at their disposable medicines and more medicines, different types of therapies, different types of interventions, and nothing worked. Finally, there was a family conference to kind of talk about different courses of action, um, and, and somehow it began in the conversation that, that they uh, practiced uh, an indigenous tradition from Southeast Asia, um, and the family asked, could it, could it hurt for us to call the shaman? Why not? We've tried everything else. So they called the shaman. The shaman came in and spent 15 minutes with the young woman. And the next thing you know, the psychotic episode was ended. And they were able to do kind of Western medical intervention of medicine and therapy to stabilize her. I don't present this story on the level of fact. I'm not saying that demons are real or that, that shamans have magical powers, or that, or that hospitals should have shamans on staff. Nor am I saying, though, well, it was all just a psychological trick, and once they found a, 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 once they found a, a medical cure that was culturally contextual, it worked. Nor am I saying that it's just a coincidence, that, that it was just time before the shaman showed up. In a sermon my colleague Victoria Weinstein gave on this very topic of second naivete, of reenchantment, she advises, there is a time and a place and a way to analyze religious narratives for their literal truths and a time not to do so. The time to take a scalpel to religious claims is when they are made with the intention or the result of excluding, harming, dominating, or humiliating people or any part of creation. The time not to do this is when a person or persons is cheered, uplifted, inspired to do good, and brought to a place of deep gratitude and love by a story that may not be based in fact at all, but is nevertheless quite true. So are there other places in our life when re-enchantment is possible? When re-enchantment is possible... I had an experience this past summer of listening to a dramatic reading of the Langston Hughes poem, Let America Be America Again. And, and it was such a, when I, when I heard it, you know, and, and whenever I read it, I'm often feeling this sense of, of disenchantment with our own 
politics, our own, our own country. And then I heard these, these words by Langston Hughes, which I think, I think are something along the lines of this second naivete. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. Never was America to me. Oh, yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath it will be. I think that has that, uh, that re-enchantment to it. Same thing is found on the Unitarian Universalist Association website where they talk about membership in a church as passing through stages of illusion, disillusionment, and re-enchantment. They say, quote, disillusionment is almost inevitable in the course of one's relationship to a church. The church is a human institution and can become all too human. When such difficulties arise, some walk away, others step back. But fortunately, there are also those who remain steadfast through these times of disillusionment and whose loyalty grows beyond it. They're not better or worse than the others, just different. Out of their disillusionment, out of their disillusionment grows a loyalty less to the institution and more to the values and ideals that the institution seeks to serve and embody. How does one grow re-enchanted? I think largely it is through, through practice. Um, it is through largely an attitude that one holds, a, a way of viewing the world, a way of viewing the world, a decision to see life in a certain way. It's also, I think, by remaining committed to values and ideals, committed, being committed to values and ideals, even with the recognition that they'll be lived out imperfectly. But in the end, by actually continuing to hold those values and ideals as worthy as worthy and through through experiencing them experiencing that sense of re-enchantment which is a bit of what I wish for all of us in the days ahead amen and blessed be